This morning we delve deeper into the question of what it means to follow Jesus and to belong to him. Some of us are only interested in following Jesus far enough to receive forgiveness, right? So Jesus says, come follow me, and we say, all right, uh, you're the Savior, I'll follow you. So we follow him, and we believe in him as the Son of God. We believe he died for our sins. So what we just did commemorates that. And then we hear his words, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and we're interested in being saved. So we confess our faith in him before others, and we are buried with him in baptism. We're immersed for the remission of sins, and we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we, we attend church. We do may, maybe some other things. And uh, we're pretty content with that. I mean, that's not a bad thing. How many of you are glad you're saved today? All right. I, I'm glad you are too. And I'm almost as glad you're saved as I am I'm saved. But we must not only follow Jesus far enough to receive forgiveness, but we need to live a spirit-led life. Because when we were baptized, and if you haven't been, you need to know this, when you're baptized in faith in Jesus, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And a lot of the things you've been struggling with, you'll have a comforter, Jesus says, a helper with you and in your life. And so we're to be listening to the Spirit and we're to be led by the Spirit. And that goes for the church as well. The church needs to be a spirit-led church, right? And that's what happens. It's not something that happens from the top down. It's something that happens from right where you are, outward, to others that are the same way. Spirit-led church. We're fortunate we have elders here who allow people to be spirit-led. You don't have to take all your works and everything you want to do and get approval for, for that. Maybe if you need some funding, you might talk to them about that. Uh, I'd like to see a fund set aside just called the Spirit-Led Fund, you know? I mean, it's not even earmarked, but we don't know who's going to step up and be Spirit-Led to want to do something, right? But a Spirit-Led church is composed of people who are Spirit-Led. That, that's how that works. And so, how many of you want to follow Jesus past the water? Past the water, into the anointing of the Spirit. You want to be Spirit-Led. You want to listen to His Word and keep His commandments. Galatians chapter 5 but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. See, we're not satisfied with just being forgiven. We want the Spirit to produce His fruit in us. That's being Spirit-led. Kindness, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, in other words, it was the Spirit that led us to Christ. It is the Spirit that allowed us to confess Him. It was this by one spirit, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, we're all baptized into one body, that is the church. And since we live by the spirit, we already said we're all glad about that, let us keep in step with the spirit. So it's not just this far and no further, it's where the spirit is leading. It could, you know, it can, it can change because the spirit is very versatile that way. He is God, he knows everything that's going to happen and he may sometimes take us away from the construction. And sometimes he might take it through it because he wants to construct in us a change. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men. Wow. Do we live in a society of people who are rejecting the testimony of Jesus? And do we sometimes find ourselves led away also? Now, but we, we are not lawless because we have placed ourselves under the teaching of Jesus and the tutelage of the Holy Spirit. And we have received that anointing. And we are walking in the light. And he's saying, don't be carried away by the error of lawless men. Now, let me just name one thing that I see very prevalent in our society and in my life today. The idea that whatever you want to do must be all right for you. Anybody heard that? Well, I wouldn't do that, but apparently that's all right with you. And whatever's all right with you is all right with me, and I hope whatever I do is all right with you. I'm okay, you're okay, right? That's lawlessness. What that is, while it sounds like tolerance, it actually is taking God's word and saying, we don't really need this, let's just kind of, you know, yeah, uh, set it over here and... Uh, you know what I've wanted to do? I've always wanted to do this, I, and, and, and I always wanted to do that. I don't think you ought to want what you want, but since I 
wants you to want what I want and let me do what I want, I'm going to say you can do what you want. That's the error of lawless men. It's, it's people who say, I'm going to live my life the way I want to. And you say, well, I couldn't possibly be that way. I'm here in church. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm preaching in church, and I am led away by the error of lawless men. I sometimes think that because I want to do it, that's the thing I ought to do. Sometimes I even know it's wrong, and I do it. Anybody else here? Is that just me? Please raise your hand. Okay. That's, that's what I thought. Well, it says, don't do that. Don't do that. Spirit-led people are people who are not lawless. They don't do what they want to do all the time, unless their want to is straightened out, and they happen to want to what God says, right? Somebody says, I don't want to. Well, you need your want to straightened out. But lawless men don't have their want to where it ought to be. And here's what he says. Grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. Grow in grace and knowledge. Now, remember the analogy at the beginning? I want to follow Jesus far enough to get the grace. I know grace goes beyond, but I'm going to use it just in this context of receiving forgiveness. We say, well, I want to grow in that forgiveness. And the more I sin, the more forgiveness I need. Some people even thought the more they sinned, the more forgiveness they got, and more grace. Therefore, they ought to sin more. And, 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 you know, Paul wrote to these lawless people. And he said in Romans chapter 6, What? Shall we continue in sin that grace can grow? God forbid. How, the, how can we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And he reminds them they were baptized into Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And they ought to not be living as lawless men, even though God's grace would cover it. So we want to grow in grace, not by sinning more, but by understanding the power of God in our lives. But... We're not content to just grow in God's forgiveness. As if it's God's job to forgive and my job to sin and be lawless, right? But he says, grow in the knowledge. Of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want you to focus with me this morning on knowledge. What does he mean to grow in knowledge? Does it mean, as I follow the Spirit, I'm learning more about how God works? Yes. Does it mean I study the Bible and I learn more about the heart and mind of Jesus? Yes. All of that and more. What does it mean to grow in knowledge? Do we memorize more Scripture? That will certainly help, for the Spirit can remind us of what we know. And that's one of the works that the Spirit does. It's hard for the Spirit in a time of temptation to remind us of a scripture we don't know. He can do it, but he doesn't usually work that way. You know, usually something comes to mind that says, stop. And that's the Spirit putting on the brakes. And I say, no, I'm being led away by the error of lawless men. Well, if that happens to you as it happens to me, come back to the Lord. He has grace sufficient for sin. He's a great Savior. And so we do not go beyond the grace of God. But don't we want to live a life more in power and in knowledge? And this is part of the growth, grace and knowledge. Now, let's let's tell a story. And for this, we're going to have to pick up God's Word, and we're going to go back to the very beginning. As I age, the more I realize everything I really need to know is almost in the first three chapters of Genesis, at least in seed form. Even Jesus' uh, future death on the cross is mentioned there by prophecy. But let's look at this. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 8. This is the Garden of Eden. Now the Lord had planted a garden in the east, in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. Is there anything prettier than a beautiful tree? Huh? And if it's a fruit tree, oh, we've got a bonanza. In the middle of the garden, there were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, right in the middle of this garden with, and just think about uh, all the things that we have around us, all the apple trees, peach trees, cherry trees, plum trees, all of the vines that we have that produce fruit and all the beauty of the oaks and the change of the the fall seasons and the beauty of spring and, and the shade in the summer. We love trees. If you haven't planted a tree, you got to put that on your bucket list, right? But right in the middle of the garden, there were two trees, and they looked just exactly like this. Uh, We didn't know what they looked like until the child painted them, and the teacher said, well, we we don't know what those trees really look like, Junior. Uh, And he said, well, now they do. (laughs) 
There were two trees right in the middle, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, you know, as long as they were within the testimony and the knowledge of God and living within the knowledge of God, they were free to eat of the tree of life and they were continuing to live. These are allegorical. I believe there were trees there, but they're allegorical for us today. We can't find the tree of life because the tree of life is now Jesus, right? So the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, though, is never mentioned again in the Bible. That's because I know what tree it was. Well, in my life, I do. It was a peach tree. But you can just say whatever tree you would have been tempted to eat is what that tree was because it says it was very pleasing to the eye and the fruit was very desirable. I'm thinking of a bell of Georgia yellow peach. I don't know about you, but there were two trees in the middle of the garden. Now you notice they can eat of the tree of life, but God told them not to eat of the, the tree of the knowledge. Knowledge. We're to grow in the knowledge of Jesus. Told them not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In the day they did, they would die. And notice, you can't eat from both of these trees. Once you make a choice that you're going to eat of the tree of your own knowledge, you lose the tree of life. But as long as you reject your own knowledge and live within the knowledge of God, you have access to the tree of life. You're not a lawless person. We hear of the tree of life again in Revelation 2 and verse 7. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. He goes on to describe that there is a river, and on either side of this river is one tree. And this is for, for eternal life and for the healing, the leaves, for the healing of the nations. So we have the picture way back there in the beginning. Let's read Genesis 2, 15 through 17. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you're free to eat any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Tree of life, all day long. But once you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you no longer will live forever. You no longer have a right to the tree of life. He's commanded not to eat of that. Let us read Genesis chapter 3. We know what happened. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say, You must not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, it's a fruit tree, and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Notice this fruit tree that has real fruit on it, God arbitrarily said, don't eat that one. God has always had a rule to test our faith. It may be baptism that you're stumbling at. You're saying, I don't see why I even need to be baptized. I just have faith in Jesus. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. There's your, there's your test, right? There's tests that he gives us in our life constantly, not to cause us to fall, but to strengthen our faith. James says that the trying of our faith worketh patience or the ability to be faithful. But Adam and Eve here are going to take control of their own knowledge of good and evil. I want you to carefully see what's happening here. They can have any tree they want. And God said, don't eat this tree, even though it's very desirable. And when she tasted, it was really good. Sometimes when I uh, read this story, I thought it was a magical tree. I thought it was a tree that when they ate of it, you know, they just suddenly got wise, like God. Because it says, you'll be like God. And later, God's going to say something similar along those lines. But it's not like God in that this was magical fruit. It's like God in that they decided they could decide what was good and evil. You see that? They decided that they could decide what was best for their life. That's what sin is. It's not growing in the grace and knowledge 
of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is a decision that we will eat of the tree of our own knowledge of good and evil. We will become lawless in that moment, and we will say, I can decide what's good and bad for me. I can. That is the sense in which they became like God, because God is the only one who can decide what is right and what is wrong. He is the only one who tells us what is good and what is evil. And when they stepped out of God's plan for their life, even though it was a desirable fruit tree, and probably if God had put that somewhere else and put another tree there, that fruit would have been just fine. The sin was that they decided they knew. They knew. And don't you recognize yourself here? I do. I mean me. I recognize me. Well, you too. Yeah, I'm preaching at you now. The knowledge of good and evil. I will take that prerogative on myself. Oh, I'll believe in Jesus and I'll go as far as grace, but I'm not going to go as far as he did in living totally within the knowledge of God. I will make some decisions for myself without consulting the leading of the Spirit and without consulting the wisdom of the elders, without consulting the wisdom of my parents, without consulting the prayer of my brothers and sisters. Genesis 3, 22 through 24. And God said, the man has now become like one of us. Oh, come on. Your interpretation that they suddenly became God-like, like God, we know that's not true. That's not what he meant here. He meant that they have become like one of us. They are deciding to know what is good and evil. That's what's happening here. And it's unfortunate for them, God is saying, because they can't do it. Now they're going to have to pay the penalty for stepping out of our knowledge. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take from the tree of life anymore and live forever. You see, Jesus is going to come, though, and make a way. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken, and he drove the man out and placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Symbolic for the fact that we are now lost. We cannot overcome our own death and mortality without the resurrection of Jesus, without God's intervention in sending Jesus. And so we're, we're lost. We, we're going to die and we're going to stay dead unless we have faith in Jesus and his resurrection. So they decided that they could decide what was best for them. In other words, what was good and evil. And they became like God. And we become like God when we say, I'm going to do this because I've decided it's okay for me. Do you see how dangerous that is? Just one little great peach tree. Well, you think it's an apple, right? Yeah, well, the kid said it was apple. I guess that's right. Man became so wicked then because of the, long, the longevity of his life. How many of you know how long Methuselah lived? 969 years. You know, God, they became so evil in that time span. You, you know, I was a better person at 14 than I am today, and I got a newsflash. You were too. You were better at five than you are today, except you become as little children. You'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. If God were to allow us to live that long, there's no tell, telling how wicked we would become. But we do have the indwelling of the Spirit to help us in our short lifetime, and it's enough. And maybe it would be enough. But he said, I will no longer strive with men. They won't live that long any longer. I'm going to put 120 limit on it. So he destroyed the world. He started over and limited the, the lifespan. You think you're bad now? I'm telling you, how bad would you be if you could live 900 years? The Lord save us from that, right? And so that's just a fact. Now, Jesus never ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He never ate from it. Now, there were a lot of trees there of, the, of his own knowledge and good and evil. But every time he was tempted, the Bible says he, he turned away from that temptation and did the Lord's will. Did the Lord's will. Now, look in Isaiah chapter 53 when it talks about his sacrifice. He took our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We have eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for ourselves. Each one of us has taken and turned to his own way. Surely as Adam and Eve did. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. God calls that you deciding what you're going to do a sin that Jesus had to die for. Didn't know it was that serious. Well, Adam and Eve tells us it's that serious. But now let's go to this next verse, which is critical. 
And yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. In other words, Jesus is going to raise from the dead, and he's going to see his brothers and sisters that result from his sacrifice. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. The church that he establishes is going to grow. After the suffering of his soul on the cross, he will see the light of life. Jesus will be alive again and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Now, I just want to ask one question. How did Jesus' knowledge justify you? You say, well, he knew a lot of stuff. How did his knowledge justify you? You see, he can only die for your sins on the cross if he doesn't have any of his own. If he's never gone outside the will of God, if he's never like Adam and Eve and like us gone over and said, you know, that looks good. I'm going to decide that's all right for me. Right? Jesus was tempted to do that many times. In all points, like he never did it. It was his knowledge that saved us. His knowledge. His knowledge. And it's your knowledge that will save your family. Not your own knowledge. And it's not referring to Jesus' own knowledge. How do I know? Because he said in John 8 and verse 28, When I'm lifted up, the Son of Man, you will know that I am the one I claim to be and that I do nothing of my own. Not even one time. But speak just what the Father's taught me. John 5, 19. Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth, the Son of Man can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. 100%. Never, never ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil for himself. Never decided that he could decide what was best for him to do. Always, always asking, always seeking, what does God do? That's what following Jesus is all about. It's not just following him to receive forgiveness and baptism by his blood on the cross and the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's about learning to live more and more, growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He can only do what he sees his Father doing because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. John 5, 30. I myself can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself but him who sent me. By his knowledge, he justified us. And that knowledge was the knowledge of God, never his own. Now, we've all eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We've all said, I know what God says, but I'm not going to do it. I know what he wants, but I don't feel like it. And consequently, we need a Savior to die for us. We needed someone who never lived by his own knowledge but that his knowledge was synonymous with the knowledge of God. And by the way, how do we love one another? By living within the knowledge of God. You can't do anything for me any better than obeying God. What if Adam or Eve, either one, had said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to obey God. That would have been the most loving thing that was ever done for them, for each other, and for the human race. There is no great mystery about loving one another. It's about obeying God. Jesus has shown us. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came unto all men, because all have sinned. Again, the gift of God is not like the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many sins or trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of one man, Adam, death reigned through that one man, Adam, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as the result of one trespass, Adam's, was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness, Jesus, was justification that brings life for all men. There is a way, Proverbs 14 says, that seems right to a man. But the end thereof leads to death. You see, they, we became like God when we eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because we are saying, 
like God, we know. And what te experience tells us and what the scripture tells us is that we do not know. And that we need the knowledge of Jesus. We need to follow him in the way that he lived. There's another tree that we read about in the Bible. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. Concerning Jesus, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. So that we might die to sins and live for righteousness by his wounds you have been healed. I think it would be amazing if in the day of judgment we find that fruit tree was what he died on. Let me read Proverbs 3, verses 15 through 18. Counsel for life. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body or medicine and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father the son he delights in. Blessed is the man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding. For she, that is wisdom, is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand, and in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who embrace her, those who lay hold on her will be blessed.